Welcome to the Software Lifecycle Stories podcast. We bring you stories of what worked and sometimes what did not in the course of discovering, designing, developing, delivering and using software-based solutions as shared by practitioners who went through these situations. In this episode of the Software Lifecycle Stories, PM Power colleagues Shiva Guru and A Narasimhan, also known as AN, explore several facets of AN's experiences. These include how he launched a startup with friends, discovering and developing innovative features by trapping OS interrupts, experiences of techno marketing, the need to adapt one's coaching style based on geography and cultures helping individuals open up and improving team effectiveness and AN's interest in philosophy. Listen on. Hi, AN. Welcome to the show. I'm very happy Hello. that finally we've been able to connect and have you as a guest. Yeah, thanks, Shiv. It's been my pleasure. And uh, we normally start, start our podcast with uh, a self-introduction from the guest. So if you could introduce yourself for our listeners, then we'll carry on the conversation from there. Okay. So I'll try to be uh, a bit uh, brief, as much brief as possible. I'm a, basically an electrical engineer with a post-graduation in industrial management from the Indian Institute of Science. And uh, from the campus, I got into a software company and uh, I worked in three companies, uh, three years. Every year I change jobs and uh, probably at that time it was a bit rare. But uh, And then uh, four of us got together and started uh, our own uh, software development company. And we were just taking all the uh, odd jobs, I mean, whatever interests us, basically into to, to do with development. Initially, I worked uh, for a few years on uh, COBOL and then uh, I was a... I've done a lot of coding in Fortran and majority of my coding career has been with C language and assembly language. And I worked a lot in uh, real-time embedded systems and uh, mission-critical software for uh, communication software for avionics uh, systems. Then we got into international market and uh, started uh, looking at uh, you know, larger applications and uh, we had offices abroad in Europe and the US. And so I used to travel a lot also on techno marketing uh, kind of assignments. So, and get some get projects. And we had very good, interesting projects. We were always looking at uh, the interest factor in the project rather than anything else. And we had some good products also. After that, uh, at some point of time, uh, the market was not so good. The September 11 uh, incident also had an impact on the internet companies and uh, small companies. Basically, we are not in, I, I wouldn't say we are an internet company, but uh, we were a small company of 100 people. So it had an impact. We were at a point of time where we had a very big product and uh, uh, we couldn't really get venture funds and uh, you know, it was our time. So I decided to get out at that time and I said, uh, enough of adventure and uh, let me do some consulting and you know so so and then that's when I got into uh, Agile introduced to Agile and uh, I was a chief consultant at Siemens then I was uh, trained by Ken Schwaber that gave me a lot of confidence and uh, it was a very successful uh, assignment I had tra you know transforming a large team of 200 plus and having they been there for three years, I was feeling a bit uh, choked after the project got over, being an entrepreneur all my life. So then I came out and I've been the last 14 years into agile uh, you know, corporate training and uh, coaching. Uh, so a number of companies uh, in India, almost all major cities and uh, in Malaysia, and also I've done a couple of trainings in the US. So that's... Uh, my journey 
and now I'm more into uh, part time. So I have reduced. And in the meanwhile, I had some a lot of personal interests in the area of philosophy. So I worked a lot on that area out of my own passion. And uh, so both are going in parallel right now. So somehow it's been uh, it's been good for me, and I'm I'm enjoying. So that's a very very brief uh, background about myself. Very nice, Ian. In fact, uh, <laughs> I liked when you said the that the venture was more of an adventure, and you wanted less of that. Yeah. <laughs> We've had a couple of other guests earlier in the podcast where yeah. they have been serial entrepreneurs, but they've also tried their hand at entrepreneurship. Okay. From being a hardcore techie, yeah. Uh, how was the transition to being an entrepreneur? I have a couple of follow-on questions which are related to agile. I'll come to that later. Okay. Uh, you know, try to understand you know, what made you, you know, venture out, and then you know, how was that journey? And then as a techie, when you said you were also doing techie, yeah, techie. yeah, yeah, we were actually hardcore uh, techies, uh, four of us. So when we were working in uh, so the three companies I worked in, one of them was a, a services company, and the second one was a manufacturer. Third one was a product development company. So kind of give me a very uh, uh, you know good introduction to different uh, aspects of the industry. And though industry was very raw at that time, and a lot of companies were uh, just starting and. Uh, Wipro and all probably had something like 1,500, 2,000 people at that time. And uh, we were uh, very confident because right from my engineering days, uh, I was doing a lot of programming. I had a lot of interest in uh, uh, programming and uh, I had uh, written a number of programs and uh, applications right from my engineering days. So I was, uh, all of us were quite of kind of uh, very confident and we just, it just happened. We just uh, decided that one day and came out and uh, we went and met a few companies. Wherever we met, uh, we had a very good uh, uh, you know, acceptance and we started projects. Within uh, probably a week of starting, we had a handful of projects. So that gave us a lot of confidence and it's been just uh, coming. So we used to just take turns uh, doing marketing or meeting and then executing projects. And being youngsters, we had a lot of enthusiasm, interest. And uh, we were also very particular about the kind of projects. And I would say we were very lucky to get that kind of project, like uh, probably the, the earliest uh, spreadsheet uh, in C language on a Unix OS was developed by us, uh, you know, two of us. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, in India, probably. And uh, companies like Wipro used to buy on their WDOS OS, and they bought it, actually. And we had very interesting software on uh, uh, IBM PC, where you could actually, uh, we developed a, what is known as an online, online um, help uh, for, a, for basic and Fortran language for people who are learning. And the kind of software we wrote was not uh, seen in India at that time. So when you are actually writing an interpreter, like writing a, a basic uh, program or using an interpreter, you could just uh, press a hotkey and move your cursor and place it on a word, press return, it will open up the document for that and show you the syntax for that word and all those things. So we used to do this kind of uh, OS, uh, at the OS level, we used to trap the operating system interrupts and all that. And I, I wrote a lot of software in assembly language that time. So that was a very huge hit actually, but of course the market was very raw and, uh, but still gave us a lot of, uh, satisfaction writing that kind of software and be surviving as entrepreneurs. Mm, very nice. Yeah, one yeah. Interesting question here is that uh, somebody I know who yeah. is a hardcore techie yeah. and you also want to do things like this and he's the way I learned it was first to write a virus. Okay. <laughs> so do you have any such uh, <laughs> no yeah. I didn't no I didn't write any virus. But uh, I hacked the certain programs at OS level and then learned certain tricks mm. how to write the operating system level. Uh, you know mm. things like uh, you know uh, inter there was interrupt interrupt twenty one where the operating system uh, does that's an operating system interrupt. So uh, uh, 
capturing that and taking over that. And uh, so when you press a hot key, you, your control will come to your program before it goes to the OS. These kind of things were not published anywhere. So we did a lot of hacking and uh, found out some of these things, actually. That was very, very, very interesting uh, days, I would say. Mm. Did some of those techniques help you with your current research, you know, trying to pick up things that are undocumented or uh, interpret differently? Uh, yeah, I would say I always had that kind of interest in any area I work on. So probably it has helped me. <laughs> I don't know, maybe indirectly it would have helped me a lot, I would say. Definitely. And we did some good projects later on also. One of them uh, was, uh, you know, uh, an encryption uh, software, a PC-based uh, firewall for sunscreen, actually, for sun microsystems. Uh, so one uh, Russian company had developed that. But they had, so they had a very technical uh, team and they developed that. They never packaged it. So we, have, we were somehow, as a small team, uh, we had good processes, I would say. And we had a very good uh, way of working. So we brought the entire uh, source code from there and we packaged it and released it to the market within uh, six months. So that kind of uh, mm. things also we had tried actually. It was pretty good. Actually. Going to Moscow and you know working with them and for a few weeks and then bringing the entire code here and uh, testing and uh, user interface, doing a good user interface and packaging it, all that. So even we tried in many areas like that. Actually, it was very, very adventurous, I would say. Mm. You mentioned uh, that you played the role of a techno marketer. Yeah. What are uh, similarities or what can you leverage out of being a techie in marketing? Or what are some things that are probably not good as a marketer? A good techie being a good marketer, what is required? Yeah. Uh, one thing I found that I think it also depends on the market probably. Uh, I would say it was the European market. It was in Switzerland actually. And uh, there I found that it was, uh, you know, uh, we were quite welcome as uh, technical people, uh, you know, doing marketing. And uh, they were also quite uh, informed, well informed. People in the, in the management also in the organizations where we go and talk about they were expect there were expectations about some of the being the you know it was very early indian market was not uh, so much grown that time and giving a project to a small company in india was not that easy so it needed a lot more uh, convincing from our side about uh, how we are going to approach the project and uh, make it a success and uh, what are the benefits and all that so that needed a lot more uh, you know technical insights also to be brought up and uh, the marketing skills, I would say, is uh, perseverance, perseverance and uh, uh, understanding the local uh, language, talking to them in between, and then having, you know, starting a good conversation with uh, senior people, management there, and uh, things like that. So these are some of the traits I found uh, were very useful there, actually. Mm, that's nice. You also mentioned that um, you know, the interest factor was something that we yeah. were identifying the projects. Yeah. So how were you able to balance that with uh, what the customers wanted? Yeah, actually, uh, customer, I would I would rather say that uh, we were choosy about the customer itself <laughs> based on the project. Okay. So we wouldn't take a project from a customer and turn it to a, you know, interesting project kind of thing. But uh, we, were we were careful in choosing the, the work itself that comes. And uh, so that way, probably we were a bit lucky to get uh, interesting projects for a long time. You also mentioned that uh, you had pretty strong processes. Yeah. And you also mentioned that uh, you transitioned to an agile coach learning under Ken Schwaber and all that. Yeah. So what is your view on one orientation and you said that uh, you had a strong process focus in your team. Yeah, yeah. And then later on, as you transitioned to Agile, yeah, learning from Ken Schwaber, yeah, one of the myths or often heard statements, yeah, Agile means no, no process or do whatever. So yeah. 
one the first question is uh, you know, the significance or the importance of uh, process orientation in software development mm -hmm. and two moving from a process focus to agile focus is that any different did anything change in terms of your understanding or priorities or uh, what you would like to do or not like to do yeah so the process uh, orientation i would talk about first uh, though we were a very small team we were always particular about uh, you know giving uh, certain providing certain statuses to our customers maintaining certain level of uh, documentation and uh, so we didn't really worry about uh, cmmi and that kind of certification but we had a pretty solid uh, set of processes we were uh, we had defined and in fact uh, there are few customers who liked it so much our document and they actually took it from us to use it uh, in their organization even in switzerland there are a couple of companies who took it from us nice and uh, yeah and so and later on we got iso certification and all that but uh, initially we had a pretty strong kind of uh, the minimal things that we do and uh, uh, you know so that that was uh, uh, minimum documentation and we will also bring it up front in our uh, proposals and all that these are the kind of documentation these are the kind of things statuses we provide and so we had a well defined uh, approach though we were a small company and uh, and that helped us a lot and uh, later on when i took the when i got into agile actually i found that even in the agile world uh, though there is a, it's a lean process and all that i think initially any team which is starting will need some processes and uh, as you move forward as you go become more and more mature you can actually reduce but uh, initially i have found most teams would need certain minimum number of uh, processes certain disciplines in the in their team otherwise they will find it uh, difficult so uh, i didn't really see a, a great uh, difference though in a in a big organization like uh, like siemens where i was chief consultant i was probably also lucky to be i was uh, the acpg leader uh, in that year Uh, so because of that i could influence a lot at uh, scpg group level software engineering process group uh, level and so we defined a separate uh, so we had a quality document document which had all kinds of different projects that we use in that uh, unit and then what are the process to be used for all that so i created a new path for agile projects and uh, brought in the set of processes that were required for that so actually we need not uh, had to look at uh, the other existing process at all so that way it will became very easy for teams to actually not get uh, bogged down by the existing you know uh, the too much of documentation kind of thing but when we started we had some minimum uh, set of things and then uh, only it it was more a gradual thing where uh, they will do away with processes over a period of time okay i don't know whether that uh, answered what you were looking for but uh, yeah it did it also triggered another question yeah uh, which is um, you know your uh, transition to agile yeah is after your stint of being an entrepreneur also you know the techno marketing and everything else yeah as an entrepreneur i'm sure there is a lot of responsibility that you have and that too as a you know co-founder or a promoter yeah a sense of ownership Yeah. Now, when we talk about agile teams, we also hear a lot about you know, self-organized, self-managed, self-sustaining. A lot of self, self, self thing. Yeah. So, what has been your experience in terms of any of those kinds of attributes of ownership, primarily being mm -hmm. held in the team? Because you are a promoter or a co-founder or an owner. Yeah. But the team or a team member who is, let's say, employed, gets a salary and all that. Yeah. How do you promote? Probably this is something that you come across in your coaching. How do you create that sense of ownership? Yeah, actually, that's an excellent question. I would say that's what is mean uh, being intriguing me in the industry when I see it. You know, many senior people in the in the industry. I always fail to understand why uh, you know it takes so much time for them to unlearn earlier practices. <laughs> Somehow, uh, though I was an entrepreneur and I had a lot of such. Uh, things you know ownership and responsibility and all that i mean uh, 
I would say I, the course, uh, the training of Ken Schwaber had a lot of uh, influence on me. I mean, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It was a, it was a big impact. I would say that uh, how much that the really the core of uh, agile is about uh, you know empowering people and all that. It came through very strongly in the in the training, and also uh, of course the uh, two three days I spent with him, I had a lot of uh, discussions, conversations uh, after the training and all that because he came all the way to Germany and we stayed together for three days there. So that was a, a big advantage, and uh, so it had a good impact on me. When I when I came back from the training, uh, I actually uh, did a lot of thinking, and uh, you know uh, I changed a lot even in the in uh, in a big organization like that. And I being in a position of uh, where I could influence, I I could actually mentor a lot of uh, uh, people at the middle middle leadership level and the middle management level and uh, all that so in the industry of course that's one of the things i see is uh, is the most difficult to do you know bringing up the mindset uh, in uh, you know middle management level and uh, upper management level that that takes a lot of effort and time is what what's my experience basically you also mentioned that you, know, you have the experience of you know, training across different geographic locations yeah. Now, when you talk about agile and uh, many aspects, including things like this ownership mindset and all that, yeah. As a coach, how does your own style change when you interact with you know, different, different cultures, but still the basic, you know, the values and principles are pretty much the same. Yeah, I think that's that's again a very very nice question. I would say excellent question. That's uh, that's again. Uh, I have done a lot of uh, adopting myself, you know, for that. So even for the training, when I went, uh, when I go to Pune or when I go to Calcutta or, uh, you know, Delhi or Hyderabad or Trivandrum, I found different cultures or uh, Chennai. And uh, so I have coach teams in Pune and in uh, Chennai and also in Malaysia, actually, uh, in brief streams of uh, coaching, a few days after the training and like that. So I find very, very different uh, cultures in each of these places. And uh, I first initially, uh, the long stint of coaching I did was in Pune, actually in, in Bangalore and in Pune. So I, I did a lot of uh, thinking and, uh, you know, how to adopt and uh, change. And after that, uh, when I moved, when I started coaching teams in Chennai, again, I found there's a, there's a huge difference in culture, the way they work and all that. But I could identify some uh, very good uh, aspects in each of these culture, which helped me a lot. And uh, so every time I go to a location for a coaching, I first draw up my approach. I sit down and draw up my approach, uh, you know, how I should actually go. So I changed my styles uh, a lot across teams and across uh, locations also. So sometimes I do a very standard way of embedded coaching, when we say and sometimes, uh, you know, there are many senior people uh, in the teams where I don't, uh, at a team level, I don't do much, actually. Because when there are multiple senior people sitting and they all have uh, a lot of experience and they understand basically, uh, you know, what is a daily stand-up or a sprint planning and all that. So in those meetings, influencing many senior people, it's, it's not an easy job. So I, I used to influence them one-on-one. Uh, apart from work, that is during coffee time or lunch time, and things. So I have approach. I have adopted a few different approaches at uh, based on the you know uh, after studying the team a little bit understanding and based on the culture and uh, you know based on the uh, locations and all that. I would say I have tried a few things there. Yeah. Okay. So the uh, compliment <laughs> is. Um, when you experiment, when you try different things, and you also said you do one-on-one connections and relationships and all that. Yeah. Have there have been instances when um, you probably hinted at something or probably gave some inputs, but uh, it was either understood very differently or implemented very differently. So in hindsight, maybe it looked uh, funny, but uh, did not really achieve the purpose. 
Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, there has to be certain <laughs> experiences like that. When we deal with so many, uh, you know, it, basically we are dealing with people and uh, teams. So I have found uh, people who are just not able to understand or not able to change so easily. And uh, so they've had a lot of difficulty in uh, changing themselves. And uh, so there are a couple of uh, teams where I have given up also, where uh, I found it's, it's very difficult or probably my style did not uh, suit there. Uh, it, that also could be possible. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, so because there is also one more reason that uh, some teams I used to coach Scrum, some teams, you know, Kanban. So that, that again brings in an additional, uh, you know, dimension of... Uh, complexity or, you know, difference in change and all that. So, again, you know, adopting for a, di at a different culture, a different uh, way of working, Kanban, different from Scrum. And uh, so these, these are, again, challenges which uh, I have faced. But I would say largely uh, I've been able to, uh, you know, in, in, in get... One thing I found always is that we have to really uh, be on the ground and... Uh, uh, get well with the with the teams. If we do that, we we can be largely successful. I think. So, does it mean that uh, anybody can become a coach? I mean, uh, I can't say that, but it needs a very good uh, you know mindset to change actually. So, if they can adopt and they are willing to stand on the ground and then uh, accept uh, probably you know uh, feedback from others and interact. Uh, well with the people, even with the youngsters, understand and give importance to their uh, views and uh, don't go with any prejudice that, you know, they're all uh, youngsters, they don't know anything or something like that. Actually, youngsters are very, very well informed and they can take their own decisions today. I found that uh, they are, uh, you know, very well equipped, uh, actually, to work in the agile way. And if we do not block them, they can definitely be uh, successful. Uh, that's a, that's another thing that I have uh, I have discovered that a lot of times the teams don't do it well because there are some uh, you know blocks above. If you leave them, uh, I have found largely uh, they are very capable youngsters. So this mindset is what is required. We have to really unlearn and uh, especially senior uh, coaches. We I think uh, you would have also experienced a lot. I am sure we need to do a lot of unlearning and uh, understand their, uh, you know, stand in their shoes and then get into their shoes and understand their situation and if they can relate to them. I think that uh, that really helps in coaching. So are there any techniques or practices that you would like to recommend to develop this empathy or not labeling people, like you said? I mean, uh, just go around then mix with them and then spend time, uh, you know, during uh, coffee time, tea time or lunch time and uh, you know, have a chat and discuss on uh, some general stuff. So basically develop a rapport. If you understand them, I think it will also help their personal, uh, you know, aspects or their interests. You also need to get some idea about that. It helps us to relate to them uh, much better. And uh, a formal way, I would say, is I do a lot of collaboration exercises. That is something which I, uh, I've been doing, trying uh, for a few years now. So that, uh, that has helped me a lot also to understand uh, in, you know, the, the team, individuals in the team. When I do these uh, collaboration exercises, activities, it, it helps me a lot also to understand their own personalities and uh, you know, things like that. So are these uh, the ones that uh, some people also call as games? Uh, game, yeah. I mean, anything can be gamified. I would say some kind of... Uh, these are more like uh, activities where they just express themselves. And uh, uh, what I do is, uh, uh, based on the teams where uh, they are, which position they are in, it may not be possible for all teams and everything. But initially, I just introduce some fun factor and uh, for some time and after that uh, i make it a little more serious and then uh, bring make it you know a little more serious like that so when we take them through this kind of activities 
one thing i found is uh, making them to we are sitting in a retrospective meeting let's say and people are not opening up or talking trying to focus on making them to speak up in a retrospective meeting it's uh, i found it's it may not be very effective so i would actually work on behind and uh, have some uh, collaboration activities where i'll make them to speak up and uh, make them get into this you know the confidence to open up and put their views and all that so when they start doing uh, away from the uh, routine uh, you know the usual meetings and ceremonies of uh, jail and all that without their knowledge in those ceremonies they start involving so i found that is more a, you know a natural way of uh, making them uh, do it so uh, that is something which has really helped i would say so do you have any favorite activity oh many of them <laughs> so uh, i mean i will just uh, you know uh, three questions for example three they write three things about themselves two of them are true and one of them is false we pair up and you know another person has to ask questions and uh, find out which is the false statement okay so actually this has generated a lot of fun in uh, some teams like this uh, small small thing i mean there is no standard way i keep uh, changing it every time i you know any any small fun activity where they share something about themselves they interact with each other they ask questions all these things we can so i have a number of such uh, activities which i actually do it with the teams mm that's nice yeah i guess probably this interest in constantly learning and okay and learning also that you mentioned uh, yeah that uh, the reason why you are interested in philosophy you mentioned also was yeah. yeah philosophy actually fascinated me a lot <laughs> initially I, i was kind of away from it and uh, my father was a big philosopher so he used to conduct classes and all i never used to attend but uh, some point of time when i started uh, attending couple of uh, i think somehow i got totally attracted and i found it very very structured and uh, very interesting and thought provoking and uh, it was uh, it was very good actually so i also found it a nice way to relax and uh, you know reading and writing it's a, it's a very good way to think and relax and uh, express yourself and all that so that probably has kept me the interest see one of the questions that uh, our listeners would be very keen on knowing from people like you is uh, how do you find time to do all this <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah this is a very common uh, question whenever i go to any team or any individual in an organization when i ask them something they say i don't have time so don't have time is the most common excuse anybody gives but uh, in my opinion if so anybody has uh, interest in any subject they will find time so it is basically the passion or the interest that you need uh, if you have that i think time is always there i don't think there is there is anybody has uh, can say no time for anything they say no time that means no interest actually so we should develop some interest so i i some part of the coaching i also tell them to identify what is that interests us what is that interests them what is that excites them what is that they are passionate about and spend more time on that and then uh, develop you know more expertise and uh, perfection in that area that will help them to work uh, overall uh, do better actually i think they have uh, somehow become kind of in the industry i find youngsters are uh, dragged into routine kind of work and they don't even uh, understand what what is about they are passionate about what excites them so if we even this collaboration excels has helped uh, some of the in some of the teams to team members to identify you know uh, take up some area and work on that that also i have seen in uh, some uh, individuals some of the teams so basically if you have passion i think you will have time now I, i would say that is a that is simplest answer i can say and i think everybody has time <laughs> i wouldn't say that they don't have time is not a not an excuse according to me yeah that's a, again <laughs> probably a simple way to put it 
So the last question I had yeah. was um, the activities that you talked about. Yeah. At least sounded more like being the behavioral kind of activities. Yeah. Are there any activities you like to instill a sense of um, better engineering practices? You know, we started with processes. So to build basically better software so that the amount of for the mundane or routine work is less for the future generation. That would be more, you know, uh, pairing up and things like that. So that actually the engineering practices, uh, for example, pair programming is uh, something for a, like, you know, it could be test driven development or automation or anything. Pair programming may not be an engineering practice as such, but uh, I would say it helps a lot in, uh, uh, in reviews and uh, cross training and, and things like that. So I encourage teams to do, you know, uh, one hour pair up with anyone in the, any one person in the team, where you just go and sit with one another person and spend one hour in a, in a day or, you know, in a, in a week or whatever it is. So over a period of time, you will find that a lot of cross learning is there within the team. And uh, for example, uh, if you have to do reviews, uh, when they are developing and review tester and a coder sitting together or designer and a tester sitting together. So it helps them a lot to do uh, cross reviews and all those things. And they, when they start spending like this, they will also think about uh, other practices like automation or uh, to speed up. Or So I, I don't know whether engineering practices have not tried introducing them through activities as such. But uh, basically a good, good collaboration, pairing up and uh, all these things uh, and uh, good retrospections on uh, how to avoid uh, manual work and you know what are the ways to improve and things like that probably uh, may help but i have not really tried uh, uh, introducing engineering practices through uh, through activities kind of maybe a good area to work on <laughs> you have any other messages or advice for people who want to get into software but there's always this uh, fear nowadays that uh, ai will take over and there is no need for <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, the some of the reports and data is showing that, but in the industry, I don't really see a direct impact of that uh, that much. I would say it still be human brains are still needed. I mean, whatever kind of automation or anything we do, there are always new areas coming up and uh, new technologies, new uh, you know areas of work that are coming up and things like that. And uh, it is always needed, I would say. Just, you know, initially when software for, for beginners, I would say uh, getting expertise in some area is very important. Whatever area they, they, are, they are passionate about or they are interested in. Work a lot and, uh, you know, if I, am a, if I am a C coder, then I should, I should be an expert in that. Anything anybody wants to know, I should be able to answer kind of thing. So if you start working like that, move towards some kind of a perfection in some areas, any one area, I think it will help them to even adopt later to newer areas and, uh, uh, you know, uh, adopt easily when there are changes in the industry or uh, market, things like that. But uh, the impact of uh, automation and all that, uh, it is there in the, in the reports and data, but in, in reality, I have not really come across that in uh, uh, that much, I would say. Oh, that's very reassuring. Yeah. <laughs> Just we will continue to grow. Yeah. Yeah. So thanks a lot, Dayan, for sharing all this. I learned a lot. And I'm sure uh, you're going to be of interest to our listeners as well. Thank you. Thanks for the opportunity, Shiv. It's been uh, great talking to you. Thanks. If you like the show and would like to share your experiences with the community or know someone else who might want to do that, please get in touch with us at podcasts at pm-powerconsulting.com. There is podcasts at pm-powerconsulting.com. Please rate the show on Podchaser, Stitcher, 
iTunes or any other podcast client that you find us on. Please also share our episodes with your friends and others in your network. If you or anyone you know would like to be featured on our show, do write to us at this email address, podcasts at pm-powerconsulting.com.